As we begin this morning, uh, we're going to be continuing to look at the signs of the second coming of Christ. But let's bow our heads first as we get ready to study God's word. Father in heaven, as we spend time studying today, we pray for your blessing. We pray for the Holy Spirit to use these words to bring glory to your name. Just help us as we study now to walk closer to you in Jesus' name. Amen. In Matthew 24, one of the signs of the nearing of Jesus' return is found in verses 4 to 13. Matthew 24, verses 4 and 13. It says, And Jesus answered and said to them, Take heed that no one deceives you, for many will come in my name, saying, I am the Christ, and will deceive many. Now, we've already looked at the coming of false Christs and false prophets. Whatever they teach, whatever miracles or wonders these imposters perform, we are anchored securely in the word of God. Isn't that right? The sheep know the voice of their shepherd and the voice of a stranger that leads away from the authority of God's holy word they do not follow, but they hear and follow the voice of their true shepherd. But Jesus continues now in verses six and on, and you will hear of wars and rumors of wars. See that you are not troubled, for all these things must come to pass, but the end is not yet, for nation will rise against nation and kingdom against kingdom. Not only was this true in the time just before the fall of Jerusalem, but it has been the one constant in world history. The history of humanity has really been the history of one war after another, whether it is fighting over territory or resources or ideologies, our world has been plunged again and again into bloody battles on battlefields all over the world. Now, some of you have served in the military, and we are grateful for your service to our country and to our defense. But you have seen the carnage and suffering that comes from war. When the first Gulf War started, my son, my oldest son was 15 years old. I stood in front of the TV watching the explosions of bombs in Iraq with what felt like a softball stuck in my throat. There was no draft at the time, but I thought, you know, if this thing goes badly, they won't hesitate to call up the draft. And I silently prayed, please, Lord, don't let my sons be sent to war. But Jesus continues now. It says, and there will be famines, pestilences, and earthquakes in various places. All these are the beginning of sorrows. Now, I don't know whether you understand or not that many of the judgments against the nations and even against Israel was because of the violence and injustice in the land. If you think that I'm exaggerating, look up the word violence in the online program called BibleGateway.com. You'll see it frequently. It's either the word violence or violence in the land, and God had particular judgments against those things. Now listen to this warning that Jeremiah gives to the king of Judah in Jeremiah 22, verse 1. Thus says the Lord, go down to the house of the king of Judah and there speak this word and say, hear the word of the Lord, O king of Judah, you who sit on the throne of David, you and your servants and your people who enter these gates. Thus says the Lord, execute judgment and righteousness and deliver the plundered out of the hand of the oppressor. Do, not, do no wrong and do no violence to the stranger, the fatherless, or the widow, nor shed innocent blood in this place. For if you indeed do this thing, then shall enter the gates of this house, riding on horses and in chariots, accompanied by servants and people, kings who sit on the throne of David. But if you will not hear these words, I swear by myself, says the Lord, that this house shall become a desolation. There's a reason why we should be concerned about the violence in our land. God has judged nations and removed nations when the land was overwhelmed by injustice and violence. Psalm 11 verse 5 says, The Lord tests the righteous, but the wicked and the one who loves violence his soul hates. We have a reason to be concerned about the increasing violence in our land. And as our nation turns away from obedience to God's law, as selfishness and self-interest become the standards of our society, as our nation turns away from justice and mercy, God is going to leave us to the control of evil. 
as we rebel against him, all nature rebels against us. You know, the Bible told us that Adam and Eve were given dominion over the world. And as we further ourselves away from God, the nature over which we had dominion will distance itself from us. And according to Jesus, there will be famines and pestilences and earthquakes. Matthew 24 continues on now with the signs of Christ's return in verses 9 and on. Then they will deliver you up to tribulation and kill you, and you will be hated by all nations for my name's sake. And then many will be offended and will betray one another and will hate one another. Then many false prophets will rise up and deceive many. And because lawlessness will abound, the love of many will grow cold, but he who endures to the end will be saved. In Luke's accounting of these verses, Jesus is recorded as adding these words in Luke 21, verse 25. And there will be signs in the sun and in the moon and, the, and in the stars and on the earth distress of nations with perplexity, the sea and the waves roaring, men's hearts failing them from fear and the expectation of those things which are coming on the earth for the powers of the heavens will be shaken. So you have two statements. In, in Matthew, because of the increase of sin, the love of many will grow cold. The, the scourge of selfishness and hatred destroys the impulses of kindness and sympathy. And men's hearts will fail them for fear of the things coming on the earth, Luke says. These things are exact descriptions of where we are today. As a, a commitment to what is right and honest and honorable seems to die out, the results are that everyone looks out for themselves and for their own. The inclinations of generosity are replaced by self-interest and self-preservation. Now, the Christian is called to live a life of love for others. As I studied Matthew 24 about love growing cold, I was surprised to see that the spirit of prophecy actually applies this to the church. In Testimony Treasuries, page 256, it says, Because iniquity abounds, the love of many waxes cold. The word many refers to the professed followers of Christ. They are affected by the prevailing iniquity and backslide from God, but it is not necessary that they should thus be affected. The fact that their love to God is waxing cold because iniquity abounds shows that they are, in some sense, partakers in this iniquity, or it would not affect their love for God and their zeal and fervor for his cause. See, an unpleasant truth is that many times the church winds up reflecting the culture we live in. True Christianity is not a modification of the surrounding culture. It is a radical departure from the surrounding culture. When we wind up siding with culture and society, it's an indication that we have sold out our Christianity. As I was thinking about this, I got to thinking about a, a man by the name of Diedrich Bonhoeffer. Bonhoeffer was a pastor in Germany during the rise of the Nazi party. When he saw the direction that the Nazi party was heading and the effect that it was having on the Lutheran church in Germany, he realized that as a true Christian, he had to break with his culture. He had to stand up and call his nation and his church to repentance. The Lutheran Church in Germany, in a national synod, actually adopted what was called the Aryan Paragraph that limited membership to any organization or ownership of property only to people of Aryan descent. Now, Bonhoeffer had a friend by the name of Martin Niemöller, and the two of them formed, immediately formed an organization called the Pastors Emergency League. It was a group of pastors who, like them, were convinced that, that what was being done was wrong. And of course, a great many Lutheran pastors joined that league. Now, Niemöller is the one who authored an interesting statement. It's one that you've heard, I'm sure. But here's what it says. It says, first they came for the socialists, and I did not speak out because I was not a socialist. Then they came for the trade unionists, and I did not speak out because I was not a trade unionist. Then they came for the Jews, and I did not speak out because I was not a Jew. 
And then they came for me and there was no one left to speak for me. Protecting people's freedoms means sometimes having to protect people we don't agree with. Bonhoeffer and Niemöller eventually would be arrested by the Nazis and hung. Because of the increase of iniquity, the love of many will grow cold. But let it not be said to us that we have sold out the culture. Let it not be said of us that our love has soured. Listen to the words of Peter, 1 Peter 3, verse 8. Finally, all of you be of one mind. So it doesn't matter where we come from. It doesn't matter what our background is, what our accent is, what our language is, what the color of our skin is. Peter is saying to us, finally, all of you be of one mind, having compassion for one another. Love as brothers, be tenderhearted, be courteous, not returning evil for evil or reviling for reviling, but on the contrary, blessing, knowing that you are called to this, that you may inherit a blessing. We are Christians first and everything else second. There is still a world to be reached. There is still a world to be preached to. As we see the signs of the return of Christ happening in the world all around us, we are called to fulfill our destiny as witnesses for Jesus Christ of the human race. But let me go back to Luke's account of the signs of the return of Christ. Luke 21, verse 25, it says, On the earth distress of nations with perplexity, the sea and the waves roaring. Remember that in Revelation, the sea was represented peoples and nations, but the sea and the waves roaring, men's hearts failing them from fear and the expectation of those things which are coming on the earth. Boy, it's easy to become afraid today as we see what's going on around us. It's easy to become afraid for our own safety and the safety of our family. Our tendency is to just look out for ourselves and our own. The only way we can overcome this fear is to fear the Lord most of all. It's our trust in Jesus Christ and his love for us that can overcome fear. He has promised us immortality because of our faith in him. The passage we learned as, as kids, John 3, 16, for God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whoever believes in him should not perish but have everlasting life. Do you believe that test? that text? Do you believe that text? I'm not asking if you can quote that text. I'm not asking if you like the text. I'm asking if you really truly believe this text. Do you have the assurance deep down in your heart that the promise of that text is real? Do you have the assurance of the resurrection planted firmly in your heart? If you do, then you can face whatever the future will bring with the confidence that there is more ahead. Love and fear are mutually exclusive. The more clearly we understand the love of God for us, the less we will fear him. And yes, I know that the word is used to re indicate respect for God because I used it earlier in that, in that sense. But you know what I'm talking about. My little granddaughter was so afraid of me. And all I wanted to do was to hold her and tell her how much I loved her. And it took me a while to win her over. I worked every chance I got to let her know just how much I loved her. And the chance finally came. It took months of smiling and waving and saying, I love you, before she could trust me. God works to convince us of his great love for us. He calls to us again and again, speaking to us of his infinite love. If we know that he loves us, if we can face life each day knowing that he is caring for our needs, then we can cast our fear out of our hearts. We can cast it out and, and live at peace in him. Not only that, but when we live out his love in a world of fear and distrust, we can expect a special blessing from him in our lives. Referring to John's statement in 1 John 4, 18, there is no fear in love, but perfect love casts out fear. The book Acts of the Apostles says this on page 551. John strove to lead the believers to understand the exalted privileges that would come to them through the exercise of the spirit of love. This redeeming power filling the heart 
would control every other motive and raise its possessors above the corrupting influences of the world. And as this love was allowed full sway and became the motive power in the life, their trust and confidence in God and his dealing with them would be complete. They could then come to him in full confidence of faith, knowing that they would receive from him everything needful for their present and eternal good. It's in the context of that love that John says has been made perfect, that he goes on to say perfect love casts out fear. And then he says in 1 John 5, 14, now this is the confidence that we have in him, that if we ask anything according to his will, he hears us. And if we know that he hears us, whatever we ask, we know that we have the petitions that we ask of him. When we are living for Christ, when we have given ourselves to him, we can live at peace with what the path of life brings to us. When our lives are lived as witnesses to his grace and power, we can trust that he has everything under control. While the love of many will grow cold, it shouldn't be our love. While the world is being overcome by fear, we don't need to be afraid. You know, years ago, I read a story about John Wesley that comes directly from his daily journal. And I actually own a copy of that that was published in 1835. So another 15 years, that book will be 200 years old. Um, but I read this story that comes from his daily journal. And, it, and the, the entry I want to read to you is dated Sunday, January 25, 1736. Now, Wesley and a group of English passengers were on board a ship bound for America when it was struck by a life-threatening storm. But also on board that same ship were a group of Moravian Christians, a very devout and, and humble group that uh, John Wesley refers to simply as the Germans. Now, here's his entry. I want to read it to you as he wrote it. At seven, I went to the Germans. I had long before observed the great seriousness of their behavior, of their humility. They had given a continual proof by performing those servile offices for which the other passengers, um, especially the English, would not undertake, for which they, would, they desired and would receive no pay, saying it was good for their proud hearts and their loving Savior had done more for them. And every day had given them occasion of showing a meekness which no injury could move. If they were pushed, struck, or thrown down, they rose again and went away, with, but no complaint was found in their mouth. There was now an opportunity of trying whether they were delivered from the spirit of fear as well as that of pride, anger, and revenge. In the midst of the psalm wherewith their service began, the sea broke over split the mainsail in pieces, covered the ship, and poured in between the decks as if the great deep had already swallowed us up. A terrible screaming began among the English. The Germans calmly sung on. I asked one of them, were you not afraid? He answered, I thank God, no. I asked, but were not your women and children afraid? He replied mildly, no, our women and children are not afraid to die. From them, I went to their crying, trembling neighbors and pointed out to them the difference in the hour of trial between him that feareth God and him that feareth him not. If we could ever come to the point of real, honest trust in the providence and leading of God, we will be able to face the storms and not be afraid. We will be able to face death and not be afraid. Oh, how we need that peace and assurance that comes from faith in God and his leading. Oh, how we need the implicit trust that God has our future securely in his hands. In Matthew 24, Jesus warns us that the love of many will grow cold. In Luke, Jesus is recorded as saying that men's hearts will fail them for the fear of the things that are happening. But then Jesus says in Luke 21, 27, then they will see the Son of Man coming in the cloud with power and great glory. Now, when these things begin to happen, look up and lift up your heads because your redemption draws near. If we live surrendered 
to the indwelling of the Holy Spirit, our love for Christ and for others will be kept alive and strong. If we live surrendered to the indwelling of the Holy Spirit, then fear will be swallowed up by faith and trust in the God who loves us with an everlasting love. We know that Jesus is coming. We know that his return is not far away. Whatever happens, he will provide what we need. Whatever happens, we can be at peace that our future is secure in him. One day, eternity will be here. One day, Jesus will come in the clouds to take us home. One day, the great controversy will be over and the Lord will come to claim his children. Let that confidence keep your love for others alive and healthy. Let that confidence swallow up fear. Jesus will carry you through whatever is going to come because he is coming to take us home. He is coming to end the struggle of the great controversy. He is coming to end sin and suffering forever. He is coming to take us home to be with him forever. No matter what happens, we can live at peace knowing that our God has our lives securely in his hands and he's going to provide everything we need. If you give yourself to him, you don't have to be afraid. So what do you say? You're going to give yourself to Jesus. Let him take care of your life. And you can live each day in, this, in the peace of knowing that he is in control. And he will bless you and take care of you. Let's bow our heads for prayer. Father in heaven, I bring every person to you who is hearing this sermon. And I pray that you'll bless them with grace and strength. Lord, we give ourselves to you. And we pray that you will take away all fear and all anxiety from our hearts. We pray that you will keep love alive, that as we meet others and communicate with others, give us a confidence and a peace in knowing that you've provided for us and that you want us to bear testimony to the people around us. Give us a peace and a sense of security that causes other people to look at us and say, why aren't you afraid? We can tell them that you have made provision for us. We know that you are in control. Give us the grace and the strength to bear testimony to your grace and power in our lives. Bless us, Lord, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen.